Hi, Ben. Hi, Bob. How you doing? I am doing pretty well. How about yourself? I'm not complaining. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available on streaming video and audio podcast. Feel free to rate and review us if you like the show. And if you don't, then find, find some other way to spend your time, I guess, other than rating and reviewing us. You are Ben Burgess. Um, you're a podcaster yourself. Uh, you have a podcaster called a podcast called Give Them an Argument, which I, I assume grew out of your book called Give Them an Argument, Logic for the Left. Uh, also, can, Canceling Comedians While the World Burns, a critique of the contemporary left. That's another one of your books. But the book we're going to talk about today is brand new. Christopher Hitchens what he got right, how he went wrong, and why he still matters. I am going to challenge you to convince me of the virtue of spending time thinking about Chris Hitchens. Uh, he, and I'm not saying I'm beyond convincing because I only started paying attention to him around the time of the Iraq war, mm -hmm. uh, which he, of course, favored, I oppose, right. and around the time of his association with the so-called New Atheists. Mm -hmm. whom I oppose not on grounds of the atheism, but on uh, the grounds of their ideas about a lot of things, including the connection between religious belief and behavior, which we can talk about. I, I, I want to mm -hmm. get around to arguing eventually, not right away, that I see a certain tension between his new atheism and his, uh, I guess, the Marxism that he mm -hmm. was associated with at one point. Seems For to me sure. kind of the opposite of a good Marxist worldview. But yep. um, uh before we get started, what, what, what I'd like to do is, first of all, kind of ex explain why I don't hold him in super high regard as a as a thinker, which isn't to say he wasn't a great polemicist or a prolific and influential writer. I can see him mattering in those senses. But uh, I want to argue why I was not I, I want to explain why I was not impressed with the caliber of his thought. But before we do that, you know, in the particular context where I encountered him. Uh, but, but before we do that, um, why don't you, just in case there are people out there who have at best a dim idea mm -hmm. of who he even was, he died 10 years ago in his early sixties. Yep. Uh, why don't you just, just explain to people sure. who, who Chris Hitchens was? Yeah. So Hitchens, uh, was somebody who spent most of his career as a, you know, left wing journalist, uh, polemicist, as you say. Uh, he's somebody who uh, wrote a string of books in the, uh, the 1990s uh, attacking uh, Henry Kissinger uh, for you know, his, his sort of involvement in war crimes and uh, in things like you know, the overthrow of Salvador Allende in uh, Chile in 1973. Uh, one attacking uh, Bill Clinton uh, called uh, No One Left to Lie to at a time when I think it was much more unusual uh, for, uh, for anybody to, uh, to attack uh, Clinton from the left. Uh, and, you know, perhaps most surprisingly of the three, uh, one attacking Mother Teresa uh, called uh, The Missionary Position, which uh, is, is an interesting book to look back on, actually, in light of, as you, you know, as you kind of alluded to, I think a lot of people, if they remember him now, they remember, you know, his um, his sort of late turn to the right on foreign policy, or they remember the new atheism. And, you know, the Mother Teresa book is not primarily a anti-religious book. It's it's mm -hmm. primarily concerned with things like her lending her, you know, sort of moral authority to, you know, pally it around with the Devalier regime in Haiti and and her um you know, kind of grotesque apparent belief that, you know, suffering was good for the soul. And so, you know, people didn't need, you know, proper anesthetics and, you know, things like that. Uh, so this, this kind of gives you a sense of, of where he's at, you know, at this, at this point in his career, just before what he's, uh, what he's best known for. Mm -hmm. I mean, going much further back, you know, he, uh, so he, you know, was born and grew up in Britain. Uh, he was involved in far left politics in Britain in the sixties and seventies. You know, during kind of the revolutionary ferment of nineteen sixty eight, uh, and he spent most of his career as at least a you know more moderate socialist than that, but certainly some kind of socialist. And 
uh, and he wrote for a British magazine called The New Statesman for uh, several years before moving to the United States and uh, and starting to write for The Nation magazine, where he was until not very long after the September 11th attacks, uh, when which he reacted to by what a lot of his former, you know, friends and comrades, you know, regarded as as this kind of shocking, you know, political reversal. Although I argue in the book that is actually a long time coming, and there was a more complicated evolution going on there in his views. Mm-hmm. I think he was very wrong about where he ended up, and you know, there's a reason that that part of the subtitle of the book is how he went wrong, not what he got wrong, because. Mm-hmm. I don't, you know, devote a lot of time to arguing that the Iraq war was bad. I kind of think if it's 2022 and you still need to be convinced that the Iraq war was bad, you know, you're probably beyond help. But I I think that the question of how he ended up with that kind of, you know, really catastrophically misguided position, you know, in, in my view, is an interesting question because he's somebody who started out with a lot of, you know, premises that I agree with. And I do tend to believe that, you know, this was all sort of happened in a very well-intentioned play way, even if he ended up in a very bad place. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's a good, uh, yeah. He, he So, yeah, he started out certainly on the left. I remember him writing for The Nation, for mm-hmm. example, uh, in the, in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, I guess, when I was at the New Republic. Um, and, uh, and then he... I guess we could say evolved. I, I see you've actually got a, a copy of the book behind you. You might want to show that, uh, you know, some of our audience is uh, is watching and it's got an actual kind of image of him. Uh, is that a drink in front of him? Is that a beverage? Yeah. A bit of, uh, yeah, yeah, he was, sure. he, he yeah. did have the occasional beverage. Uh, the, the um, so I, I actually debated him a couple of times, mm-hmm. once online, and I know, uh, thanks, by the way, for highlighting that. You, you have, you do this kind of, I guess, Thursday night debates thing uh, where you review actual do play-by-play on debates, and you dredged mm-hmm. up a debate that I had with him, I don't know when exactly, 11, 12 years ago, maybe maybe mm-hmm. longer ago, uh, on, on Blogging Heads TV. And you were, uh, I, I, I thought, you know, you're, you're, your analysis uh, was not unkind to me. Thank you. Uh, I, I think um, so. I noticed in the comments, the YouTube comments, uh, some people saying uh, or somebody said, "Wow, I've never look, seen Hitchens look that bad." I, yeah. I, I, I'd like to take credit for that, but I just think he had an extremely weak argument to defend. No, um, I think I think that's I think that's right. I think that in that in that debate, I mean, one thing that made it kind of unusual, right? We, we should like say a, it was about his book. God is not mm-hmm. great how religion poisons everything. And I want to get into that a little more deeply because that really highlights sure. why I did not wind up taking him seriously as a thinker. I just thought it was, it was such an incredibly sloppily done piece of thinking, not writing, mm-hmm. uh, you know, fine writing, but just not a serious exercise in analysis, but go ahead. Yeah. So I, I think that, uh, you know, the thing that's unusual about it, is not that it's a debate where I think his position is wrong. I mean, you know, he, I, I, I think, you know, I think there are a fair number of those, although not usually about religion uh, from my perspective, right? I, I, I think, I think it is unusual in that it was a debate about religion where he wasn't arguing with, um, he wasn't arguing with somebody who said, "No, you're wrong. You know, there, there is a God," or you know, "You're wrong. Right. You know, you do need yeah. to be a." Christian to make sense of morality, uh, but but somebody who's arguing uh, that well, even if there isn't, and even if you don't, uh, then it still it still doesn't make sense to say that you know that that religion sort of plays the causal role in right. a lot of the things that you're objected to that you say, and and I think that I, I my sense from that debate was that. Uh, he was, you know, he was just very unprepared for that point of view that he, that there were points where he even kind of slipped back into sort of. Yeah, he kept, he kept thinking I was a theist or something. Right. Uh, I, I mean, I don't think he really thought that it was just, it was just the territory where he was more comfortable, but I don't think it was just that he wasn't prepared. Let me explain what I mean. Yeah. I just think he he had an indefensible. Ar- I, I, it's not that it's not that his argument 
that religion has horrible effects is intrinsically indefensible. It's just that the argument he had put forth in the book was so weak. And and let me explain what I mean by that. Okay, so the Mm -hmm. subtitle of the book is How Religion Poisons Everything. Now, even if you discount for subtitle hyperbole, he's clearly Mm -hmm. arguing, even if he's not saying religion is always and everywhere bad, he's saying it exerts overwhelmingly bad influence Mm -hmm. on the world. He has to defend that thesis. Now, you know, for starters, to really seriously get into that, you'd have to get into the whole question of, of, you know, when when people do something in the name of religion and well, say I, that 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 that's why they're doing it, is that really why they're doing it? Would they not be doing it if it if it weren't for religion? Now, I don't expect them to get it even. I, I don't think that is such an intractable question that I'm not sure. even demanding that he get into that. Let, let's put that aside. It seems to me that. But yeah. e- even so, and I, and I do want to get back into that because yeah. that gets into the whole Marxism yeah. thing. Yeah, exactly. I, I want to get into that. I want to get into that. But first. Let's grant him, uh, you know, like uh, a rain check on that. He doesn't have to address that. It's a really hard issue. But it seems to me he does at least have to acknowledge that although many bad things are done in the name of religion, many good things are done in the name of religion. Again, leaving aside the question of religion played a causal role in either case. He he has to grapple with the number of uh, people who have set up homeless sh- shelters and say they did so because of their, uh, their Christianity or whatever and have done good things. And he ha- and and if he's going to uh, well, let me, let me just tell you how he go, goes about addressing uh, this problem. Mm-hmm. Basically, what he does is say when people do something bad in the name of religion, it really is a product of religion. <laughs> but when people do something good in the name of religion, it really isn't. Now, you may think yeah. he couldn't be saying something that stupid. He, I mean, uh-huh. he, could, he, couldn't be, he couldn't be evading the actual challenge that egregiously. But let me give you an example. So, yeah. um, you know, an obvious problem would be like Martin Luther King, right? Right. Okay. So, which is, which, which is definitely one of the two most unconvincing arguments in his book. Uh, he, the other one was about Stalin, you know, because that's the that's the opposite problem, right? That the uh, right, that, right. I, I think he doesn't address that. The, the the number of people who didn't believe in God who did horrible things. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's you're right. That that too. But but on on the King thing, uh, he basically argues. The king wasn't really a Christian. And I want to read you this quote from the book, okay? (laughs) Quote, at no point, uh, you know, he's talking about people who uh, harassed King, were unkind to him. Quote, at no point did Dr. King even hint that those who injured and reviled him were to be threatened with any revenge or punishment in this world or the next, save the consequences of their own brute selfishness and stupidity. And he even phrased that appeal more courteously than, in my humble opinion, it, it, its targets deserved. In no real as opposed to nominal sense, then, was he a Christian? So so just to, in, in, there was a lot of words there. What he's, he's saying he's, he's is- not, He's not a Christian because he forgives his enemies. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so A, uh, I, I mean, it isn't, it isn't just that, there's plenty of places in Christian doctrine where they say, forgive your enemies. And, and, and Hitchens is saying, because he forgave his enemies, he's not a Christian. Sounds crazy. But even the idea that if you look at the actual theology, as opposed to these particular scriptural exhortations, that, that the people uh, who, who were hard on King should have been condemned to hell, that's not even correct doctrine. I mean, Mm -hmm. Christianity says that they can be as mean to him as they want, as long as they accept Christ as their savior and ask for forgiveness of all their sins. So, which is actually, which is actually a much better, uh, you know, criticism of Christianity, you know, that uh, should you, you know, should you really have that moral free pass, you know, but yeah. If you want to, if you want to, if you want to criticize Christianity, fine, but that's, that, that's kind of beside the point here. The point is he, he, as an intellectual matter, the first thing you, you would say to somebody who's going to set out to write a book with this thesis is, look, you got to deal uh, with those cases where people do good things in the name of religion. And you got to do an at least passably half-assed job of it. This is embarrassing. 
this is embarrassing. Right. And I can't even believe that somebody, you know, that, that like if you're an editor at the publishing house, like, what, what do you, I mean, do you say to your colleagues, okay, this is super embarrassing, but we can make money uh, or, or what? I mean, this is not an argument. And, and by the way, one other question I'd like to get into with you is like, what do we mean by a public intellectual? You know, mm -hmm. uh, it may, you know, maybe we should say a good polemicist is an important intellectual. Fine. But this is not thinking. This is not serious thinking. It's not serious analysis. And it's a whole book. It's not a piece he wrote. It's not a blog post. It's not a tweet. He wrote a whole book that is so obviously flawed at a foundational level that is does not deserve to be taken seriously. Now, do you disagree with me about that or, or is your thesis mm -hmm. just, well, he had his bad years and, and they were toward the end of his life or what? Uh, yeah, a little bit of each. I mean, I think that I think that God is not great is very mixed bag. Uh, I do agree, like I said, that the that the you know, Martin Luther King part and the Stalin part are uh, are definitely the weakest, uh, you know, the weakest arguments in the book. And but but I, just, and I just quick, and I I'm sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll quit, wait, I'll quit sure. interrupting you, but sure. they're they're foundational. If he can't address them, he shouldn't write the book. You can't, you know, you, 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 you take that point. They're foundational. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that the I think that part of the problem is that there's ambiguity about what the scope of the argument is supposed to be. Right. So, so it's, uh, cause, uh, you know, the, the subtitle, uh, sort of doesn't make any sense on its face. Right. You know, that like, well, wait, you know, religion poisons everything. Right. I mean, like, like, you know, everything is a lot, right. I mean, like, 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 is there, is there no human activity that's, that's not, uh, you know, poisoned yeah. by the influence of religion. That seems very unlikely. Uh, and, I forgive him for that. I'll discount and, you know, you know and, and but, say he's just arguing that religion is overwhelmingly bad. And it's a yeah. So so if it's, you know, I mean, if the argument is that it's much more, you know, bad than good uh, in its effects. Uh, now, whereas I do think and I say in the book that, like, if we're actually supposed to be doing like a, you know, utilitarian calculus about that. Man, I have no idea how to even begin to evaluate that because right. you know if you're, you know, yeah, how how many you know how many homeless shelters do you have to have to you know make up for you know the Spanish Inquisition, you know, like that's uh, that's 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 hard. But right. uh, but I think that he, I think that if that's the if that's the thesis, which there are some you know places where he he indicates that it is, and there are others where he seems to go way way further than that, you know. But if that is that I think he could do it without sort of take biting such extreme bullets, you know, as like saying, oh, uh, Martin Luther King, like they, you know, the passage you wrote, read was really bad. But I mean, like even, uh, you know, there are even other ones where he sort of suggests that's like, well, uh, I don't, you know, I mean, in the, in the debate with you, I think there was a point where he said, well, you know, I don't know what was in his heart. It's like, OK, come on, because if we're going to play that game then, you know, you have to discount all good and bad effects. Right. Uh, where, where is in Osama bin Laden's heart? We right, never right. know for exactly. sure, do we? No, exactly. So, uh, so I think that that's, um, I think that's a big, I think that's a big problem. Uh, I, I think that on, um, you know, whereas I do definitely think that the last quarter of, of his career, you know, 2001 to 2011, was you know was the one where his his arguments were weakest and you know some of, some of his positions, I think uh, were in, in different ways really indefensible. Um, I, I also think that I also part of why I was interested in engaging with him, thinking about him, you know, and taking another look is precisely because on the religion issue, I do think of him. Maybe you disagree as a really mixed bag because on the one hand, I think that, um, as you say, he's like taking the argument to these extreme links that are very, you know, that like one, he doesn't really need to, to make his core point. And two, I think he does. Are, are, I think he does. Again, if, if his okay. point is that the effects of religion are overwhelmingly bad, there mm -hmm. are at least two issues he, he has to address. And one is the, the, the good things done in the name of religion. And he clearly does that in a, in a facile and ineffective manner. And then the other is the one you mentioned, which is uh, the various uh, atheist 
evil people, and I, I don't think he succeeds in that either. But well, I think I think again, this is fundamental to his argument. Yeah, I mean, you could. I mean, I think the, the second one certainly is not, and I think he's I think he's taking on more than he needs to there because I think I think he could I think he could say. You know, like, look, religion doesn't have to be the only source of poison to be a poison. I think I think you could make that argument, by the way, not even my position. But like, I think that that's I think that that's an argument he could make without trying to do the gymnastics that he does to try to put Stalin, you know, on the tab of like the long term influence of religion. And uh, and I think that I think that on the Martin Luther, you know, Luther King question, I think that there is a way that he could try, you know, that he, you know, that he could avoid that one. Although, uh, although I think that there's a reason that he doesn't. Right. So I think the way that the way that he could try to avoid it would be to, without saying silly things, like we don't know what is in his heart or, you know, he didn't, you know, he didn't threaten his enemies with hell, hellfire or whatever. And, you know, by the way, I would say, look, yeah, there are things in Christianity that, say, you know, forgive your enemies, turn the other cheek, all of that. Right. Um, there are also things, you know, there is also, you know, a long tradition in Christianity. Uh, there are numerous instances of, of, you know, of saying, you know, threatening people with hellfire or saying of course. that they should, they should be right. punished in this, in this life. But, but see, if and, I can and, just... And, and, and the reason, I, I was just going to say, I mean, the reason that I think that it's, um, you know, and this is actually gets to one of my problems with with his anti-religious polemics because I think that um, which one is the you know like which which strand of the tradition represents like real Christianity mm-hmm. I think is a silly question because uh, I mean it it's certainly look I do too know, but he can't think that because no, no, he has exactly. to be something of an essentialist exactly. to make his argument. Exactly. He has yeah. to be something of a religious essentialist and think that religions have these inherent characters that infect the minds of the believers in, yeah. a, in some kind of predictable way. No, I think I think that's right. So so I think uh, well, actually, let, let, let me just say really quick, right bef- before going deeper into like what I think is wrong with with his his argument here, that um, that I think that I think there is um, that. I think there are a lot of things that he has to say when he's not, you know, he's not debating Robert Wright, but, you know, but, but he's, uh, you know, he's debating, you know, a, a Catholic archbishop, you know, he's, 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 you know, he's debating, you know, like a sure, hellfire sure, pastor. Sure, 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 you know? sure. Again, I have no I, issues with the atheism part. Uh, that's not, you know, sure, sure, sure. But that's but I mean, not his book. That's but, Sam but, Harris's but, book. Well, <laughs> well, sort of. Actually, sort of. part, actually, part, Sam Harris, I think, has the same fallacious conception of, Religions, yeah, I, I, I influence think I, on the world, but that aside, anyway, I'm not I, arguing I think, with I the atheists. I, I, I actually think Sam Harris is even worse, but I, I think that the in some uh, ways, yes. Uh, but I think that the, but I was going to say, I think that you know there are places in the book, in those debates, you know, elsewhere where I think he does have, um, I, I, you know, I think he does have well argued, and I think he does, I think he does have like. Uh, eloquent and interested things to say. I think that there is an aspect of uh, this kind of humanistic moral critique of, you know, for the reason we were just discussing, right? I won't say like, you know, Christianity, you know, and block, but like, I, I think like at least very standard and very common, you know, Christian beliefs mm-hmm. that I find powerful and compelling and we could get into that. Now, that said, I think that, uh, you know, what he could have tried to do on the Martin Luther King question, but there's a reason he didn't, would be to say, okay, sure. So um, let's just grant that uh, Martin Luther King uh, was uh, motivated by deeply held uh, Christian faith uh, to do these things, but he could have pointed out, and you know, there are places where he sort of does a little bit, but this is not his main line, right? You know, that, um, that you know, you certainly don't have to... Um, you certainly don't have to agree with Martin Luther King's, uh, you know, theology and, you know, the arc of the universe bends towards justice and all of mm-hmm. that uh, in order to 
uh, heroically fight, you know, for integration. In fact, look, I mean, you know who else heroically fought for the integration? The thoroughly atheistic, you know, Communist Party right. USA, right? And so, you so, don't, and you don't have to uh, share Osama bin Laden's Islamic uh, <laughs> beliefs yeah, exactly. to believe that the U.S. Exactly. is an imperial power that needs to be fought, right? I mean, that this this yeah, works that's, on that's, both that's sides. Why, that, that that's just, why, I'm sorry, that's, that's, that just does not. That's why work. he doesn't. That's why he doesn't. That's why he doesn't. That's why do he doesn't this, do right? it. But right, you know, because okay, because fine. there's the, there's a. And this is, I think, the and this is, I think, the real problem. You know that I, I spent a little lot of time in the book giving him a hard time about that. Uh, that with the historical argument, especially because you know Hitchens is someone who you know who thought of himself, right? I think sincerely, but I think I think sometimes he was he was fooling himself, right? Who thought of himself as a lifelong adherence to the materialist theory of history. And, uh, and there, you know, if you take that seriously, right, like he'll, he'll do this thing sometimes, right? Like when he, when he's arguing, um, you know, like about the Stalin question, for example, where mm-hmm. he'll say, okay, but find me people, you know, who have followed the teachings of, and he'll list off this, like, you know, laundry list of like nice secular thinkers, you know, Epicurus and Thomas Jefferson and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, who have like then, you know, done certain kinds of horrible things. And then I'll grant that you have an argument. And the problem is, I think the first thing you should notice about those guys is the historical periods in which they're writing, right? That they, that like, you know, that that he's, he's, he's got a couple of people in like ancient Greece and Rome, and then we skip ahead to the Enlightenment. And the real question is, okay, Christianity was the justifying ideology of European feudalism. And if we imagine a world, you know, where it was not, where, you know, yeah. the uh, Emperor Constantine didn't, didn't convert to Christianity and, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and this, you know, so the question is, well, look, what would have been? And uh, it certainly wouldn't have been the nice, liberal, pluralistic, you know, secular humanism that Christopher Hitchens likes, right. uh, because that wouldn't have gotten the job done of convincing everybody that, you know, the peasants need to stay in their place and, you know, and all of that stuff mm-hmm. so that this mode of production, you know, could, uh, could, could operate, you know, that wouldn't have worked, you know? So, so it's, it's, it's very unclear to me that what would have existed there would have been, uh, would have been, would have been better. Right. And so, so mm-hmm. I think that the, you know, so I think that's one like huge problem that is it, you know, is it that religion poisons everything or is it larger historical forces yeah. poison well, well, everything? Right. Well, this leads to the Marxism problem. Like, what the hell kind of Marxist makes this argument to begin with? And I want to get to that. Let, let me say, and one reason I want to get to it is, I mean, I don't think it's fair to spend all our time asking mm-hmm. you to defend this particular book. Mm-hmm. I would concede, concede it probably wasn't his finest moment. You have more things you want to say about his virtues. I want to eventually get to those. First, I want to get to the Marxism question. Before that, I just want to, just sure. just as an asterisk say, I do think the Stalin question is foundational. I think if you're going to okay. argue a world with religion is a worse world than right. we would have if there weren't religion. Well, you need to look at, you know, there are examples. We have case studies, leaders who didn't have religion. How did they do? I I, I think you do have to address that. But I'll I, I don't want to. I mean, I, I, mean wanna... I mean, for the you know, for the sake of argument, I guess you could say, look, uh, would a would a world without racial prejudice be better than a world with racial prejudice. Of course it would. Uh, the Are there people who do things that are, you know, morally equivalent to what the KKK does where like, well, you know, racial prejudice is the particular thing that motivates them, you know, also mm-hmm. true. So, uh, yeah. So as, as for the Marxism, um, you know, uh, uh, I wrote a book called The Evolution of God where mm-hmm. I went through and, you know, the point you made uh, about Christianity, there's bad stuff in Christian scriptures, too. The point of my book was that's always true with religion. Right. There's always a menu of options to choose from. And the, the question is, how will religious people choose at any given point? Will they choose to find the tolerant part of their scriptures and focus on that and behave in a tolerant fashion? Or will they focus on the belligerent things? I argued that the answer lies in the material uh, factors right. surrounding them. In particular, do they have reason to uh, to see 
their relationship with a given group as zero sum, as fundamentally a relationship of, of, a, of, of, an, of enmity, or one where they can kind of do business with them, in which case mm-hmm. they'll, they'll, they'll find reasons to be tolerant toward them. I went, I went through kind of the whole history of religion um, and made that argument. Now, somebody that I think uh, both you and I uh, were fans of, Michael Brooks, you know, I knew mm-hmm. him a little. And, and uh, one thing I liked about Michael is he was one of the kind of few people who read my book and said, that's basically a Marxist take, at least in the mm-hmm. sense that it's very materialist. It's, right. it's um, and, and it is. And, and, and my question, and, and Hitchens is, is the opposite of Marxism. I mean, Marx, you know, look, I'm not mm-hmm. a scholar of Marxism. You know better mm-hmm. than I, but I thought the basic idea, I mean, I didn't mention Marx in my book. I don't know right. enough about Marx to say, but, but I, I thought the basic idea was that, um, you know, you have in, mo- in modern Marxist terminology, you have kind of like base or infrastructure or something. You have the set of material circumstances, the economy, the, the relationships of power within the society, among soci- societies. Those things are fundamental and causal. And mm-hmm. then the whole superstructure, the ideology, the religion, and so on, it reflects those things. Now, uh, it, that's not to say that religion is quite... Uh, entirely epiphenomenal, I guess you would say. Mm-hmm. But fundamentally, I would think a good Marxist would say, well, if you want to know what a given Muslim is going to do, don't look to Muslim scripture. Look at the circumstances of their existence and ask yourself how they, you know, how they are going to channel what, uh, what part of scripture they're going to focus on. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, it's perf- per- you know, perfect example, right? I, I actually, uh, I don't, think this made it into the final draft of this book, but uh, when Michael was uh, working on his book... Um, on the intellectual dark web? Uh, yeah, yeah, against the web, and and I was, you know, like reading chapters and stuff, and it's... Uh, and uh, there's this passage that I think he was quoting at one point, or talking about quoting maybe, you know, in there, which uh, is from a sub-book about the uh, war in Afghanistan, you know, the Soviet war in Afghanistan in the eighties, uh, and where there's this like remarkable quote from, you know, some like there's this like Mujahideen kind of like military strategy meeting where they're talking about, you know, doing a suicide bombing basically. And these, you know, ultra, like, you know, essentially the craziest Islamic fundamentalists in the world at that point, you know, are in this meeting and, and people say, no, we can't do that. You know, can't send somebody to, like intentionally kill themselves, you know, that, that, that would, that would violate, you know, the, you know, Islamic law. Right. You know, and, uh, and it's, it's kind of a remarkable thing, right. Cause if you have the sort of, um, you know, worst of the, you know, the, you know, like the sort of silliest versions of the new atheist idea that like, you know, why do suicide bombings happen? Well, you know, here's some like blood curdling passage in the Hadith somewhere. We can just draw a straight right. line from one to the other, and ignore the question of why, like, why is it happening, you know, now, you know, like at the beginning of the 21st century and not like in the 18th century, right? Why not the, right. you know, why not the 14th century? Right. Yeah. I, I think that's exactly, I think that's exactly right. And like, I, I, I kind of I reference against the web extensively in here because I think that, uh, so I think there are two problems, right? One is the materialism problem, uh, which, which I think is, I, you know, again, is something I push very hard in the book that the, like, it's not like having that view doesn't mean that you don't think superstructure plays any, you know, causal causal role. I mean, presumably, if it didn't, what would be the point of it, right? You know, that the but like that it's um, but that you know the the role of the material base is more fundamental, right? I mean, that's why right. it's the the you know the base, and um, and then the other problem. Uh, you know, you kind of already alluded to was is the you know is the the essentialism problem that they that like when we talk about religions, we're talking about vast cultural traditions that uh, include lots of people, you know, saying lots of things at lots mm-hmm. of different points in time, which means that within the sort of language and sources of those traditions, you can find support both for the worst, you know, most fundamentalist, most reactionary things you can imagine, but you could also find people who have, you know, like find their way to a value system 
that you know that 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 comports with a lot of the things that you or me or Christopher Hitchens would like and express it within language of uh of that of that tradition and and there's nothing that's like there's nothing that makes one of them um I mean really to my mind I mean like put the sharpest point on this this critique I mean this is the the only way it makes any sense to me to say that like one of these is right and the other one is wrong is if you think that ultimately all of this really does come from God, right? You know, and, and, and that like one of them is like correctly, you know, it's like, oh yeah, this is, you know, this is the, you know, like this is actually reflected, you know, what God wants, you know, like if you, if you don't believe that, right? I mean, if you believe that it's all man-made, then uh, given that uh, manifestly all of these traditions are are messy and, and contradictory, uh, then, um, then there is nothing, you know, there is nothing that makes emphasizing or sort of drawing on one aspect uh more you know like more intrinsically the real thing you know yeah. than uh than emphasizing uh than emphasizing or drawing on another one yeah i mean the the only thing i'd add before my next question is i mean you said there, there's these two problems his, his idea of the relationship between kind of base and superstructure and then the essentialism problem i think they're they're very if not the same problem they're very closely connected mm -hmm. it's like if you are a religious essentialist you're kind of attributing uh tr i think tremendous causal power to the religious belief itself uh, as, a, mm -hmm. as opposed to seeing uh a given a, a given body of religious thought as something that could have various kinds of expression depending on the on the material circumstances but uh let, let me ask you so so how do you account for this? Again, I, I, I was not paying attention to him before kind of uh, the run up to the Iraq war. I assume at some point you would you would say, yeah, he was a good Marxist with a coherently Marxist worldview. By the time he writes this uh, religion book, that seems to not be an accurate description of him to me. Mm -hmm. Did yeah. he change or, di or, or yeah. did he just never write stuff that where he really had to seriously address the base the superstructure mm -hmm. problem mm -hmm. or what you know whether he whether yeah, he really was a materialist or like what's and feel free to tell us what was great about him before sure, this sure. <laughs> sure so 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 i think that the uh so i think on the like question of christopher hitchens earlier marxism there are there are maybe two questions there one is the descriptive theory, right? You know, historical materialism, and the other is the you know normative political program, and um, certainly on the second one, you know, by two thousand one, he's unambiguously you know outside of that, right? You know that they, that's that's definitely true, but also I'd say that it's much easier to say on the second one that uh, that earlier he. He was, you know, co committed, you know, to to those things. Uh, on the descriptive question, I think that's a lot more elusive. I think that the, I, I think that what I find fascinating about this is that there are times like there's a there's a sort of back and forth he has with Norman Finkelstein in the uh, 2000s where he shows that he's at least, you know, read uh, some. Uh, like, like what I think is like a really good explication of historical materialism, like the, like, like the book that, you know, that he'll cite, you know, it's like, oh, if you, if you want to, uh, if you want to know what, um, you know, if you want to know what the, you know, like what historical materialism really is and how it's different from, you know, various caricatures or whatever, you should read the, you know, G.A. Cohen's, you know, Karl Marx's Theory of History, which I love that book, but I, I, I'm, I'm often, you know, I, I think what, Hitchens himself got out of it, and whether there's an extent to which he always had a little bit of an idealist uh, worldview underneath, you know, like mm -hmm. a little bit of a worldview according to which, you know, the, um, you know, ideas good or bad in people's heads are having a, a more primary, you know, historical role mm -hmm. than otherwise. I think that's entirely possible. I think that would be consistent with uh, with most of what he what he wrote. Um, what he what he wrote before that. I mean, something he'd always emphasize is that well, historical materialism isn't uh, isn't you know deterministic. You know, there's room for you know, voluntary human action, which I think is true. But I also think that um, I, I mean, I think no matter how sort of loose and non-deterministic your your reading of it is, like if you don't 
on some level think that, you know, the, if we want to explain why, you know, Thomas Aquinas's beliefs and not, you know, whatever Epicurus is, you know, were like dominant in Europe and the, you know, the middle ages that if you don't think that ultimately that's going to have something to do with the material development of that society, the, you know, this, the sort of fact that the, you know, the forces of production, you know, we're at this place where, you know, it's a primarily agrarian society where you basically wanted to, you know, keep, you know, keep peasants where they were and keep them, you know, and keep them sending, you know, money to you know, the churches, the lords that, that I think that I, I, I don't know what to say, but I think on the, um, and and uh, on the the normative uh, on the normative political program there, I think that there's a much more straightforward story to tell about where he started and and where he ends up. Right. So, uh, first, what do you know? What do I think his virtues are? Well, I think that uh, I think that he uh, I think that he wrote a like a pretty tremendous body of good work uh, in the first you know, 30 years of his career, uh, pre, uh, pre-2001. I think that the three books that I mentioned uh, at the beginning are all very good. I think that the, I think that, uh, I think that the body of work that he was writing, you know, for the new statesman, for, you know, for, uh, for the nation and, you know, in the, in the eighties and nineties, I think that's very worthwhile. Did, I think, can I, can I yeah. ask, did he have, uh, important kind of new ideas. And, and the reason mm. I ask, I said I wanted to get mm. at the question of like, what is an intellectual? And, and let me give you a, just a sure. couple of recent data points in my own sure. recent consciousness. Um, one was listening to this conversation about, uh, uh, it was about Joan Didion uh, yeah. yep. it, 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 on the uh, podcast, uh, Know Your Enemy. You oh, know, yeah. you, you I, know was, the, I actually listened to that episode. Yeah, yep. with Sam, Sam Tannenhaus, who, who's, who's great. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I started wondering, like, what, you know, they don't attribute any kind of new ideas to her. They, they, they she may have some. Uh, then the other, the other data point was like, I was on Twitter and, you know, Jeet here, and I think mm-hmm. it was David Cleon were talking about George Packer, kind of an assessment and blah. And I was like, is he even worth it? Like, has he had like, it, he just seems to me a guy who, who who just gets foreign policy stuff wrong, and 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 I'm not aware of any like intellectual innovations, new ideas or anything. And G and G at one point said, I I think he was a he's a he, he is a great prose stylist, and I thought, well, okay, I guess that counts. And and, and uh, but I'm personally more impressed by people who have actual new ideas, like like you know you you you, you there are people like this, uh, mm-hmm. and. Uh, I'm I'm wondering in your assessment of Hitchens and in these mm-hmm. early books that you champion, mm-hmm. what are did he did he is there an argument he's associated with that was new or an idea that was new or was he just a particular a particularly effective kind of rhetorician on behalf of certain ideas or what which, which look impresses me if I, I would love to be as prolific uh, as as he is and and all the rest but. Uh, but it is different uh, from being, you know, somebody like Marx, right? Who has an sure. idea. <laughs> sure. Look, look. If if the uh, if the if the if the comparison is, uh, you know, if if I could like, if there was like a demon who was gonna, uh, who uh, who was going to either destroy and wipe from everybody's memory, you know, like everything Christopher Hitchens wrote or everything Karl Marx wrote, you know, that wouldn't be a hard choice for me. Uh, but, uh, in the, in the absence of that, I, I guess I would question, uh, this sort of emphasis on, on like newness as the, uh, as the, as the be all and end all, right? Like, 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 is it only important that you're sort of like, fundamental views are really different from the fundamental views of people, you know, before you or, or mm-hmm. after you, like, I mean, that's certainly, that's certainly like one thing that's impressed. I mean, you know, if they're different and you're right, right, then that's, then that's impressive. Right. Well, you know, even if, if you're fruitfully if wrong, but it's new, that's you know, something, right. Cause people react to it and, and uh, progress can happen, but yeah, I mean, sure. Okay. You know, if you're if you're uh, if you're right or if you're wrong in a sufficiently interested way, you know that that's a that that's that's a uh, uh, that's a good thing. Uh, although, 
although even there, you know, I mean, I wonder because I think that like, I think that progress, you know, I think, I think just like particularly, um, good presentations, you know, of, of, of cases, you know, can like inspire people to, to yeah. dig deeper yeah. to, to see, to see what's wrong, you know? Yeah. Uh, so even on the intellectual progress front, you know, like I'm, I'm not sure how much the, uh, the, the nudist is, uh, is important, but look, if, if you're okay. going to say, if you're going to say in either of those cases, right. That like Joe Didion, right. I actually think that's like an interesting analogy for, for this, right. Or, uh, or Christopher Hitchens, um, you know, look, is, uh, you know, is Joe Didion somebody who saw the world in, you know, in fundamentally different ways, you know, than, uh, than, than other, you know, than other writers who came before her? Probably not. Uh, is, is Joe Didion somebody who uh, is an interested figure who's worth engaging with? I think probably still yes. And I, and I, you know, and I, and I think, Again, I, I listened to that episode. I thought that you know, I'm I'm glad I listened to it. Right? Let's 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 say that. Right? Like I I think that like I think that it was, I think is an interesting discussion. I think that there's something you can learn from like thinking about how someone as smart and eloquent as Didion, who in some ways had a worldview that's just totally alien to mine, you know, had like like saw things, mm-hmm. and I think that in the case of somebody like Christopher Hitchens, who somebody who starts out having, you know, seeing the world in many ways, much the way that I do, I think, uh, and, you know, and so I think, you know, doesn't you know, necessarily win any prizes for, for sort of fundamentally different ideas, but I, I, I think is, you know, largely correct. Uh, and then ends up at the sort of place that we were critiquing before this sort of this, this had this sort of combination of positions, in the two thousands, that is this, Again, you know, maybe from your perspective, this is even too generous, but I think there's a very mixed bag of atheist output and this completely indefensible uh, set of foreign policy mm. positions. How it, how it is that he ends up there is interesting. And I think it's interesting if you think, like it's not interesting if you think like somebody just like, you know, that he he was just, you know, he just like, hated Muslims so much that like, you know, that like that blinded him to everything or, you know, he, I don't know, you know, he just, he just liked, you know, he just liked being on CNN too much. And then, you know, that, that's why, that's how he ended up there. Stuff like that. If you think one of those things then no, I guess it's not very interesting. Right. But if you think like I do, that this is a, you know, smart guy with good intentions, um, having this, this interesting path into this really bad place, right? Yeah. That's interesting. Well, let me ask you this question, which I think is related to that. Uh-huh. You said you said there is real merit in being someone who makes powerful arguments, just presents, even if there aren't a lot of uh, big original ideas, someone who is in effect an effective rhetorician lays out an argument powerfully. I have the same respect for a well laid out argument, but uh, I do like to see the the arguments made honestly, and I don't really like that term honestly, dishonestly, because I I don't think the arguments we call dishonest I, I think are rarely the result of a person consciously deciding to be dishonest. I think the way you know cognitive biases work and so on, it's more sure. complicated than that. But you kind of know what I mean. It, it it's somebody who uh, who doesn't address the strong counter arguments. Um, and, uh, and, 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 or, I mean, does the kind of thing I pointed out with Martin Luther King, where, where, where you're like, you're, you're like either, wait, either he was just like, there was something wrong with his brain at this point, <laughs> or he is being dishonest, right? I, I mean, you know, it's, it's like, what's going on here? And, and my, my question for you is, uh, mm-hmm. a- asking it as someone who's totally unfamiliar with his early body of work. Mm-hmm. You know, would you say that he was an honest arguer? And, uh, you know, like when I worked at the New Republic, uh, Mike Kinsley mm-hmm. was the editor. And it was something I was always very mm-hmm. impressed with him about is I, I felt he really was an honest arguer. Mm-hmm. He would concede the weak points in his argument, the th- you know, the strong points in the in the opposing argument. Um, and I, I guess my question to you is if I went back in the earlier work, would I not find these kinds of like lapses in just, just the, the presentation of the argument? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that again, is I I don't I know what you're asking. I don't know that it's exactly a question of of honesty. I think for the reason that you said, but I think that the I think that what it's maybe a question of is like too much ego being bound up in it to you know to like admit you know to yourself or to others you know that the uh, that you know that there is that there is this weak point right you know that they yeah and, we all have that problem you know yeah 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 I think we all have that problem I think we all have it in varying degrees if you want to say was you know what if you know like does Christopher Hitchens' list of character flaws include you know having you know having that to a greater extent than, you know, Michael Kinsley did, you know, that, that I think quite possibly, yes. Right. I, I think, and, and that's, and that's probably, you know, that's probably true. Uh, that's probably true throughout. What I don't think that he was, was a dishonest arguer in the sense that he wasn't like very sincerely morally committed to the things that he was arguing for. And that's where I think you, you know, again, I think that's what makes this question so interesting, right? Because, and and why? And one of the reasons, by the way, that I think it's it's useful to think about, write about, because if you have, you know, if you identify with the, you know, the sort of political faction that you know Christopher Hitchens, you know, did for most of his life, and then didn't, you know, for the last, you know, for the last decade, you know, that this sort of, um you know, the anti-war left, you know, the socialist left, that that then, which which I do. Right, identify with all of those things. I think we have a bad habit of assuming that everybody in the world sort of secretly agrees with us, and that they uh, and and that like anybody who says they don't it, like must be on the take or something. That you know that but like like I was, I see this all the I time. I actually think that's a that is a thing on the left, maybe more than is a thing of human nature, and probably. Could be on the right, but I but I know what you mean. Any anyway, yeah, yeah. I I think it's probably more on the left. I actually think my my sense is that um, is that like a lot of yeah. I think I think this I think this particular thing might be more of a pathology of the left than that than it is elsewhere. Because I think like I, I've got to say my my sense is that whereas like lots of right wingers will say that anybody who disagrees with them is, you know, whatever, a depraved sicko and hates right. America, whatever. But like right. I see a lot less of the everybody who disagrees with me as a grifter stuff on the uh, on the right than, than I do on the I, left. I think that's right. And um it and has so to do I, with the different worldviews. It kind of makes sense when you think about it, but we don't need to to get into that. Uh yeah, yeah. So 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 I think that like people um so I think people will sort of apply this in the the Hitchens case and uh, and and say like oh you know he just sort of sold out or something and I don't think that's it I think that there are two I think there are two things that that happened that kind of explain this big shift in in his thinking uh, both of which in a way are kind of about the end of the Cold War uh, and him sort of adjusting to that in the in the nineties right so so one is. And I find this like really interesting because another one of those explanations that I don't entirely buy is people say, oh, you know, like the, the big thing that's driving him uh, to take these horrible positions in the final years is Islamophobia. And look, if you want to say that some of, you know, some of the sort of essentialism about Islam, not fundamentally different, I think, from the essentialism about Christianity, but some of the essentialism about Islam in the final years, if you want to call that Islamophobic or if you want to call the uh, the way that he wildly overestimated the sort of realistic threat that Al-Qaeda style terrorism could pose to Western society. It's Islamophobic, not a particularly unique Christopher Hitchens problem, by the way, but you know, the uh, you know, pretty, pretty general at that point. But I wouldn't argue with you on either one of those. But I think that one of the biggest reasons I don't I think Islamophobia only goes so far as an explanation is that the first war where he starts to warm up to the idea that maybe, you know, American empire can be a force for good in the world after all, isn't one where the mm -hmm. U.S. is bombing Muslims. Uh, it's it's the 1990s when the U.S. intervenes on behalf of Bosnian Muslims against Serbian Christians. Uh, and then the sort of second act of that in Kosovo in, in 1999. And I, I, I think, and also I think that even the, the Iraq position, that part of what's going on there is that after the first Gulf War, which he opposed, he spent time in this you know, Kurdish enclave in northern Iraq. 
And, um, and as you know, my, my friend, you know, Gene Bajalon points out, you know, as Kurdish, uh, some of these Kurdish leaders in Iraq were, you know, had been seventies radicals themselves that could speak to Hitchens mm-hmm. in his own language. And of course, for very obvious reasons, they were all for, you know, the United States taking care of Saddam Hussein for them. Uh, and, and this is a, this is a really important connection there. I mean, in the two thousands, he wears a flag pin that's not, you know, that's not the stars and stripes. It's the it's the Kurdish flag, and and I think that's I think that's a deeply felt thing. So if it's not Islamophobia and it's not that he's just on the take, then what is it? And I think that one, I think that in a post Cold War world, I think a lot of what he was writing about, like in the nation in the eighties and nineties, was about the United States, like Reagan's, like backed, you know, dirty wars in Central America, stuff like that where the United States is just backing these like hideously brutal right-wing authoritarians. And then I think it starts to seem to him starting in the nineties, then more so in the two thousands that, well, hold on, right. You know, the United States is not really backing people like that. You know, the United States is, is fighting with people like that. Right. You know, so, so I think if the United, if the U S uh, if George W. Bush was fighting wars, against like peasant communist revolutionaries like LBJ was in Vietnam or Reagan was in Nicaragua. I don't think that Hitchens ever would have been able to bring himself to support that. But I think that, you know, he can look at, you know, he could look at uh, Slobodan Milosevic or Saddam Hussein or the Taliban and say, hey, does this look more like the kinds of people the U.S. used to be fighting or this new world? Does this look a whole lot more like the people that I objected so much to the U.S. backing? So I think that's one thread. And then I think the other thread is the giving up on socialism, which uh, which is, you know, over the course of the 90s, I think that it's it's a very, you know, I, I think if you have left views, um, I think people often forget, you know, just how bad, you know, just how bad a time period that was, uh, that I think there, there was this sort of pervasive sense, you know, Summarize. Granted, this is not always a fair read of the book, but like at least by the title of you know Francis Fukuyama's you know the end of history, mm-hmm. uh, this this idea that like in the Cold War, even though Hitchens, when he was a far leftist, was a Trotskyist, he wasn't a fan of the Soviet Union. I think that when the Soviet Union existed, it was a little bit easier to think that these big questions about how to structure a society were still on the table in a way that they just didn't seem to be anymore in mm-hmm. the nineties. And he was still calling himself a socialist through the end of the 90s, but I think it got increasingly tenuous. I think that he, I think that like to a certain extent, I think that that same stubbornness that we were talking about is probably by the end of the 90s, the only thing that like kind of keeps him calling himself that, which he kind Mm -hmm. of admits to in his memoir, H22. He says that, you know, like every time, you know, he says, you know, thinking back to it in retrospect, you know, he thinks that like part of what like kind of kept him going at a certain point was that every time he went on C-SPAN, Brian Lamb would ask him, you know, are you still a socialist in like this really condescending way? And like he kind of didn't want him to win, you know? So, uh, so I think by the end, by the end of the decade, right, by 2001, before 9-11 in Letters to a Young Contrarian, uh, he has admitted to himself that he no longer really thinks that socialism is on the table historically. And I think if you put that together with the fact that he spent so much of his life as a globetrotting journalist, going to places like Saddam Hussein's Iraq and, you know, meeting dissidents and befriending people like this, that he's, he still cared about people who were living under various kinds of despotic mm-hmm. regimes. And if socialism was no longer on the table, you know, he at least wanted to hold out some kind of hope for democratic revolution. And then this is the exact point of this chain of reasoning. You know, I, I can be sympathetic right up to this point, right? And then, but then I think that the really indefensible part is talking himself into, because he just didn't see any other vehicle for making this happen, talking himself into the idea that like the 82nd Airborne could be a vehicle for for spreading democratic revolution in the Middle East, which I think we've seen in the last 20 years. Just, just worked what a out catastrophe as, that is. As well as one might have hoped. So so yeah, I mean, I think that's a that's a fairly effective rebuttal of, of the claim that uh, his foreign policy was driven by Islamophobia. There's a distinction I would make between the Bosnia uh, on the one hand and Kosovo and Iraq on the other that uh, not many other people would make, I admit, mm. because this is just sure. a hobby horse of mine. But the uh, the Bosnia intervention was under international law lawful. It had uh, Security Council authorization. The Kosovo one did not. 
Iraq certainly didn't. So with Kosovo, you started to see just kind of NATO say, well, we'll decide what the just wars are here. Whereas with Bosnia, you did have Russia, China. It was the Security Council. You know, it was technically a legal intervention under international law. Uh, and I think a, a, a not unrelated distinction is that Kosovo, more than Bosnia, struck Russia as an affront. If, if, you, if you trace the Ukraine crisis <laughs> back to its roots, when, when did things start to go south with Russia? Kosovo is almost like the earliest uh, thing where they started saying, like, wait a second about right. NATO. And I think that's interesting. And then Iraq, of course, was egregiously unlawful. Right. I mean, right. and, 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 and it isn't just that, well, you couldn't get the Security Council to sign on to it. You had gotten gotten the UN to get Saddam Hussein to allow inspectors to come into the country. And people forget that, you know, I mean, people to this day say, well, what I don't get is why didn't he let the inspectors in? Um, excuse me, he did. And right. they were being allowed to inspect every facility they wanted to inspect. We had to demand that they could leave so we could invade. And 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 that's where I gotta say, like. Wait a second. You know, I mean, what is your uh, what is Chris Hitchens's conception of how the world should work? If if yeah. if, if now I understand that the left uh, has ambivalence about international law because it sounds fine in principle, but the fact is, it's more powerful nations that have more clout. Security Council consists of powerful nations. Uh, that said, you know. What kind of leftist are you if we if we get the guy to accept the weapons inspectors and uh, and they are in a perfectly peaceful man manner examining our claim that there are weapons in mass destruction? How, how I, I don't get I don't get how anybody supported that war. Almost, yeah. But so 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 I think in a weird way, uh, you know, Hitchens position on this was probably exactly the opposite, you know, like sort of mirror image opposite of mine, because I always thought, right, I mean, as, um, you know, like in, you know, when I was, uh, you know, 22 and 23, and I was going to anti-war protests all the time, you know, in uh, 2002, 2003, like I always, you know, I always thought, I always argued to people that uh, it sort of didn't matter, you know, that like, that, that, that it could be that whether Saddam Hussein, you know, had had weapons of mass destruction or not, you know, that it, it wouldn't be justified, you know, even even if he did, right? You know, that the that this this sort of idea that uh, that he was going to share those weapons with Al Qaeda was always kind of nonsensical on its face, and you know, and and yeah. and it's it's not, you know, the idea, um, you know, it always struck me as a little rich that the you know that the only country in the world that's ever actually used an atomic bomb on people, you know, is, is going to war to stop other people from, you know, developing weapons of mass destruction. Uh, and, and I think Hitchens' position was precisely the opposite, which is that in a way, I think he didn't think it mattered either, you know, that cause, cause his, you know, his reason for, for supporting the war wasn't, you know, really primarily anything about weapons of mass destruction. You know, it was that this was, this was like a, you know, supposedly, you know, a war of liberation, you know, that was going to, that was going to bring, you know, bring democracy uh, to, to Iraq, you know, so I, so I think the WMD angle wasn't the one he cared about. Now, I, I know, I know your point is less about WMDs, more about international law, uh, how, how much he would have cared about that. I'm not clear on, I think that's possible because of, I think it's possible that he could have gone pretty much straight from the kind of leftist skepticism of the UN that you're talking about into, you know, it's actually very, I think it's very unclear what you should call the combination of political positions he holds later, late, late in his life, you know, because mm -hmm. people, people will say things like he became a neoconservative or whatever, but then like, you know, you could watch, um, you know, on CSPAN 2002 is on with with Andrew Sullivan, um, and there's this and and there's this very strange moment where both of them have been arguing for you know it's 2002. Both of them have been arguing for invading Iraq, and a caller comes in and calls in, and the caller says, um, "Well, uh, don't you you know? Do you think that it undermines America's you know sort of 
uh, moral authority and demand it stop Hussein following UN resolutions when, you know, the United States is constantly giving cover to Israel and violating UN resolutions. And, and Hitchens says, oh, yeah, I, I, I agree with that, right? You know, that does. And so we should stop doing that. And, and then, of course, Sullivan takes great affront to this and they have this huge argument because, um, you know, because in Sullivan's head, terrorism is terrorism is terrorism, whereas... Mm-hmm. In Hitchens is in 2002, he still thinks, you know, the Palestinians have a legitimate complaint. This can't be lumped together with Al Qaeda. Uh, and, and he does have a lot of positions like that that just don't really fit this kind of neoconservative uh, framework, you know, that he that he has. So, you know, again, you know, the the uh, the occupation, you know, opposition to the occupation of Palestine, uh, you know, the opposition to torture, uh, there's actually a Vanity Fair piece where you know he he had himself waterboarded for like the two <laughs> I seconds. I still remember whatever. the video. He didn't last very long, I'll tell you. Before no. he said no moss, you know, it's like, and I guess waterboarding is pretty horrible. I I, I wouldn't have lasted longer, I'm sure, but that's like a one second video. <laughs> you know, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It's 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 uh, it, I mean, it gives you some sense of exactly how bad that must be, you know. And and uh, mass surveillance, he actually. He was actually like a party to this, like you know, class action lawsuit uh, to um, uh, about you know about NSA uh, you know surveillance uh, you know even even while he was he was supporting the wars yeah and and certainly I think that you know anybody who remembers what the two thousands were like I don't think that anybody who was interested in sort of worming their way into the good graces and the hearts of the American right in the Bush era. Would have uh, would have done that by making their primary public mission uh, militant atheism. Mm-hmm. You know that this this is this is a time when the right wing is just you know thoroughly identified with uh, with the the evangelicals. You know, so I I think he has this like weird messy contradictory positions. I think like how that would have like whether that would have resolved itself into something more coherent if he'd lived longer is an interesting question. And if so, which elements would have gone? Mm-hmm. Uh, but um, but I think it is possible that he went straight from a sort of left wing anti imperialist suspicion of that whole framework of international law, and the Security Council, and all that stuff, into you know to speak very loosely a sort of neo conservative skepticism about you know about that 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 tradition, and like never stopped at the point of saying like yeah maybe it's like really good for the world that you know that we that we have these you know these kinds of stabilizing institutions. Yeah. Um, by the way, Andrew Sullivan uh, did move later somewhat uh, more on Israel, somewhat closer right. to what the, the position Hitchens mm-hmm. had at that point. The um, uh, I, I, I had a thought about, um, you know, we uh, we were saying we were tentatively both agreeing that uh, accusing your intellectual adversaries of being grifters on the take is more common on the left uh, than the right. It occurred to me that it is something that has surfaced, that it's common in the intellectual dark web. Now, uh, those Mm -hmm. people might say they're not on the right. Brett Weinstein says he voted for Bernie Sanders, but I think you and I would agree that there's a certain uh, uh, right-wing flavor there. And and that's just kind of an interesting, uh, that's just an asterisk I thought I'd throw out there. There is much, there there is generally a more conspiratorial Mm-hmm. mindset among a lot of the people associated with that. Of course, it's kind of uh, fallen apart uh, uh, and imploded. Yeah, but, but, cer- but certainly like the Weinsteins are very conspiratorial. And, uh, totally. you know, I, I, I think, um, you know, I mean, I guess, I guess uh, I don't, I don't really, I don't really know whether, whether Jordan Peterson is or not, because I, I, I I've just sort of, got into the point where I can't quite tell what he's, you know, like, like what he's trying to say anymore. But, um, you know, I guess, I guess to his credit, right. Like Sam Harris, who's somebody I really dislike. I mean, I think that like everything that's sort of bad about late Hitchens, uh, you know, more or less, right. Is, 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 um, is present at least in his basic worldview without, you know, without very many of the redeeming qualities, but to his credit, I mean, he did, he did break with those people over exactly this subject. Right. That's right. Um, the uh, that reminds me. There's one quick uh, rebuttal on on your mm-hmm. Thursday night mm-hmm. debate about my debate oh, yeah. with Hitchens. 
you, 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 uh, you know, I pointed out to Hitchens that the ultimate foundation mm. of secular morality is not as firm as he might think. Mm. Mm-hmm. And I think you or your co-evaluator, uh, your, your co-play-by-play guy, uh, said that what I didn't understand was that the same was true of religion. I do understand that. I just, I just thought Hitchens was arguing that the the ultimate foundation is firmer in the case of secular morality. I was saying they both actually have a deep problem here. Mm-hmm. The reason Sam Harris made me think of that is because I think you and I would agree that if you, if you paid much attention to that book, The Moral Landscape, mm-hmm. Sam doesn't understand that, right? I mean, S- S- Sam doesn't understand that science cannot, as I think he almost put it, prove the validity mm-hmm. of a moral system because there there has to be uh, a kind of establishing of values at the foundation of the system that science is not going to provide us with, right? Yeah, I, I mean, the, the the move that he always wants to make is, you know, is really strange because he'll say things like, oh, you know, David Hume thought that there was this difference, you know, there's this gap between facts and values and mm-hmm. all these people since that have thought that, but see, that's wrong because, and then if you pay close attention to the because, what he's really saying is something that actually nobody has ever denied, which is that once you kind of figure out what your normative goals are, that sure, can science tell you things about how to achieve it? Of course, sure. it can. Right? Of course, you know, right. Like, exactly. Like, like no, nobody's nobody's ever denied that. I mean, that right. you know, Hume certainly didn't deny that. Uh, so, so I think that I think that the real trick with with Harris is is just kind of assuming. Uh, assumed utilitarianism uh, and, and you know, but sort of like sneaking that in in a way where all of the emphasis is on how if you assume utilitarianism, then uh, then science can tell you stuff about how to maximize utility without sort of, you know, it's like it's like Seinfeld, you're yada yada the best part, right? I mean, like mm-hmm. you're, you're, you're yada yada over what's most important here, which is, you know, the argument about the extremely not obvious thing, which is like, what's the right, you know, moral theory. And right. and I think that, I think that like, as far as religious ethics goes, I would argue that, um, you know, like divine command ethics, the idea that like things are ultimately right or wrong because, you know, God likes them or not is like a particularly, a particularly implausible, you know, moral well, theory. It's more conspicuously implausible in a way. It, uh, then the comparable problem on with secular morality, I guess I would say. Uh, in other words, well, anyway, it, we, uh, this is a this is a tangent. Let, let me, um, I, and I know you've got to go in uh, in ten minutes. So mm-hmm. uh, let's see. Well, I, uh, I guess I want to. I mean, first of all, I noticed speaking of the intellectual dark web back when it was intact. I guess its unofficial yeah. uh, magazine was Quillette. Yes. Um, and I noticed uh, you got a re- there was a review of your book in it, as I'm sure you're aware, and uh, oh, yes. <laughs> was not entirely favorable. I'm no. sure that you I've 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 been criticizing Colette. I'm sure, sure. Both, of, both both you and I consider that a badge of honor. So congratulations on that. Yeah. But what's interesting is that the guy who reviewed it is himself writing a book on Chris Hitchens. So yes. apparently I'm just wrong. Chris Hitchens is is this, and again, I don't deny uh, uh, the question of influence. Uh, yeah. I, for all I know, he was deeply influential and mattered in that sense, and that's worth writing about. Anybody who who uh, is, you know, look, I mean, Jordan Peterson is an important figure in that sense, even though neither you or nor I apparently can ever figure out exactly what he's saying. Um, he, he, yeah, well, I, I, I will say I've, I've actually started to have more trouble lately, you know, because because he's gotten as hard as this is to believe. I think he's actually gotten like way more intense lately than he even was uh, before, and, and it's and it's made it's made everything that much more confusing. But look, I mean, I have written stuff about Jordan Peterson. Uh, in his case, you know, I mean, certainly not because I think he's a great he's a great thinker, and and not even. You know, in the as in like the Hitchens case, right? You know, like, like that. Like I think Hitchens is this like extremely interesting writer who, even if he doesn't, you know, even if he doesn't have sort of you know at the high level, you know, assumptions, you know, about the world, like groundbreakingly new ideas. I I, I think I think is is somebody who 
uh, you know, I, whose work I find, I find like worth engaging with kind of on its, uh, you know, on its, on its merits, but like, you know, Peter said, I, I, I think it's just a weird mess, but also I think that you, I think you do have to write about and talk about it, think about it because, you know, it doesn't, uh, because, you know, like probably right now, I mean, I don't know, it's been a while since I checked this, you know, but like probably right now, if we went over to Amazon and looked at like the hundred most read, you know, uh, bought and read books at the last week, uh, probably at least one of, you know, either, you know, the new book Beyond Order or the old one, you know, 12 Rules for Life is probably on there somewhere, yeah. you know, even even yeah. so. And I, and, I, and I think that you do have to engage with things that lots of people, you know, even if they shouldn't, right, you know, take yeah. take seriously. I think that you, I think that you still sure. have to, you still have to engage with them if, if they do. I was just going to say real quick on the, uh, on that uh, that that Quillette uh, review, um, I think you know. I, I think it's you know. I, I think one thing I will say, whereas I did find the review frustrating because I, I I think that the guy just got a lot of things you know factually wrong. You know, like I I, I think I think it was just kind of sloppy. Uh, you know, people can, you know, if you just Google, right, you know, my name, my name and that you can find me, you know, sort mm-hmm. of going through some of this, but like, I, I think, I think one thing that that did help bring home to me that sort of along the same lines, maybe of how we might forget, right. Okay. You know, Jordan Peterson, you know, seems ridiculous to us, you know, but like, you know, how many people really take it seriously that like, as I was writing the book, I was thinking, you know, it's like, okay here's this like interested figure who's really significant in the two thousands. And he got a lot of things really wrong at the end, but you know, it's been like when the book came out, you know, about a month ago, right. You know, it was like, we're going to write it like the 10 year anniversary of his death. This might be a time when people are open to, you know, to like a reevaluation. They're starting to, you know, grappling with what was good and bad there. Um, But like, I, I think, I think it surprised me a little bit, although it shouldn't, right. I have no good excuse for it surprising me just how many people are still out there uh, like the guy who wrote the review who are just like unreconstructed fanboys of like very late Hitchens mm-hmm. and just, and just sort of think he was right about all this stuff. And, and I, I think, I think maybe sometimes I get into a little bit too much of a bubble and I just sort of assume that's like, yeah, okay. Right. You know, we all kind of know that like a lot of this stuff doesn't hold up now, you know, that's not the interesting question. Whereas I, I I think that there are quite a few people still walking around to say no, you know, it was the uh, yeah, you know, Hitch Hitch was awesome and he was and he was and he was clearly correct at all points and you know and and why don't you think so? Yeah, there are two views, uh, and then there's mine, which I guess is the third view. <laughs> uh, so well, thanks. Uh, if there's anything else you want to. If you want to spend one minute just telling yeah, people sure. like. If they went, if they visited the stuff of his that you think is best, what sure. what things would they be most impressed by? You know, his, his uh, would Hitchens as a stylist. You know, he was a very effective uh, orator writer. Um, yeah, I mean, he, he was he was an extraordinarily effective uh, style. You know, um, stylist. I think certainly in terms of, I mean. Ironically enough, given how we started the conversation, I actually think that he usually, I think that he was, uh, I, I, I think he was like one of the best debaters, you know, in, in, in kind of at least the, uh, the sort of YouTube recorded history of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, I think that the one with you was, was actually, um, and, you know, well, no, this is a, you know sincere opinion it's not just that we're talking and you know and, I, and i'm being nice because i didn't i didn't know you when i you know when i did that earlier right you know that they i think that i think that was an unusually sloppy example but i think i think that i think that usually it you know that usually he's extremely effective in that medium and yes i think he is a very good pro stylist i don't think it's just the pro style though i think that there's i think that um i think that at his best uh he has a way of marshalling arguments that even if it's not necessarily, you know, that like, oh, you know, he's like coming up with with groundbreakingly original assumptions about the world like a great philosopher. Uh, he's still, uh, I think he's still, I think he's still sort of 
seen things from an angle that will sometimes surprise you. I think that he has a way of marshalling arguments that if you, if he's on your side, you know, he's the person that you want to be on your side and, you know, and, and, uh, and, and it's extremely satisfying to read if he's wrong, uh, even with many of the things that he was writing the last in the last ten years, you know, we could do we could you know maybe mm-hmm. disagree about which are examples, but you know, even with even with that, I think he has a way of making you pause and 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 think, okay, well, shit, that's actually an interesting point. Let me think about that, right? You know, mm-hmm. that they which which I find at least um, this is um, you know at the risk of sounding. I'm not sure, you know, nostalgic or off-puttingly elitist or something, but like I find sort of depressingly rare in the media landscape that we have right now that they, uh, that like, like, like Christopher Hitchens wrote for Slate and, and I have a really hard time imagining like going to Slate right now and reading something I disagreed with that had that quality where, you know, there were conclusions that I disagreed with that were argued so forcefully and with so much eloquence and with sort of like, you know, and, and with things being brought to bear, you know, a, a historically a kind of an odd angle that would actually like make me pause and think, am I missing something here? Mm-hmm. You know, is, is there a better case for this than I, that I thought? And, and I think that that's, I think that that's relatively rare. I think that, I think that there is, um, even if he did suffer from this, this, um, you know, overabundance of ego leading him to to not concede points that we talked about earlier which which I think he did you know but I but I but I think even if that's the case I think that there is a uh, I think that there is a certain kind of intellectual honesty in a lot of these um in a lot of his arguments and evaluations I think it's very interesting to look for example at the uh the debate you know not like a in person debate but debate in open letters and stuff that he had with his lifelong friend Martin Namus in 2002 uh, over, um, you know, communism essentially and, and, and sort of Amos, you know, kind of grouping it all together, you know, Trotskyism equals Stalinism equals whatever. Mm-hmm. And Hitchens, not long after he has given up on all of that, you know, just, just sort of not being able to stomach it and say, no, you know, what you're saying here doesn't, uh, doesn't make sense. Uh, and, and I think that, I think that like, when I read that, even though it's at a time when he's taken, you know, very bad positions on many things that I adamantly, that I adamantly disagree with, I, I, I can't help but think like, look, if I'm going to, if I'm going to disagree with people, I'd, I'd so much rather disagree with Christopher Hitchens than they disagree with, you know, most of what's on the market right now. Okay. All right. Well then everyone should definitely buy your book. Uh, it, it's called Christopher Hitchens, what he got right, how he went wrong and why he still matters. Um, your podcast is called give them an argument where, what's your Twitter handle? Uh, at Ben Burgess at Ben Burgess. I am at Robert writer. Uh, this podcast is called the right show and I put out the non-zero newsletter and I guess that's about it in, uh, in self-promotion. Thanks a lot for taking the time, uh, Ben. That was really fun. All right. Thanks for having me, Bob.